Hello, and welcome to Science Gallery Dublin. I'm Jane Gleeson, the Events and Community Manager at the Science Gallery, and tonight we're excited to present the first in a number of events held in collaboration with the US Embassy in Ireland. This partnership has enabled us to bring a selection of exciting and innovative speakers to Ireland to participate in our 2020 programme. For many, plastic is a cursed word, a pollutant that can't degrade fast enough, but for art conservators, it's a cherished component, component responsible for conserving a collection of sig significant works. That's why tonight, we decided to host an event that would bring together a panel of experts to pose questions about the sustainability of these techniques and whether or not we should be looking towards new materials for future conservation. A couple of reminders before we begin. We advise you to use your phones during the event. Tweet, Instagram, and share it to your heart's content, but please ensure that your phone is switched to silent mode. In case of an emergency, the exits are based on either side of the stage and through the door so you entered upon arrival. Now, without further delay, I'll hand you over to our moderator for the night, Ian Brunswick. Thanks, Jane. Oh, okay. um, welcome. Uh, so, we have a really interesting discussion, I think, ahead of us. Um, but I'm going to kick off by introducing our speakers. Um, and I think uh, we have an amazing uh, and diverse lineup of, of perspectives. Um, myself, I'm Ian Brunswick. I was previously the head of programming at Science Gary, and I, uh, I was once and future will be back at Science Gary. Um, at the moment, I'm on career break, and actually, Malcolm's colleague over at uh, the Smithsonian. So um, give me two weeks and I'll be a science guy person again. Um, to introduce our panelists, uh, I'll start with Gavin. Gavin is a uh, Dublin-based artist and a curator with an interest in cultural sites and histories. And his intertextual practice involves the assemblage of unique fabricated elements, sourced and found objects, images and texts, and has incorporated acrylic plastic, which we'll be talking about a good bit. Um, previously known as plexiglass perspex. We were discussing all the different names for these things that we give them. Um, Gavin is also uh, has a book on seeing only totally new things, which is published by the RHA in 2013, and he is the co-curator and director of Palace Projects and Studios. So um, welcome, Gavin. Um, Brenda, uh, whose work actually came up when we were uh, researching this exhibition, um, is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, is in the conservation department of the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, where she's been responsible for the preservation of objects made from plastic for over 25 years. Uh, so plastics are no new thing to you at all. Um, she organized the conference Plastics, Looking at the Future and Learning from the Past, uh, and How Green is My Plastic? Um, you're very good with the titles. Uh, and at the V&A, she led the museum's input into uh, an EU-funded project, Pop Art, dealing with the preservation of plastic objects in collections. Um, Malcolm Collum, uh, on my left, is the NGEN Conservation Chair at the Smithsonian, uh, the, National, uh, the National Air and Space Museum, um, and has been chief, the chief conservator there since 2008. Uh, he has a BA from the University of Minnesota, uh, and actually grew up in Wisconsin, where I went to university, so there's like six degrees of separation we could play uh, for quite a while. Um, uh, if you want to talk about the Neil Armstrong spacesuit, uh, Malcolm is your guy. Uh, and in his current position, um, he manages the conservation unit, uh, working with curators and restoration specialists to devise appropriate preservation methodologies for aerospace artifacts. So um, one thing that we talk a lot about plastic is where is it going, what's going to be done with it, how does it degrade, who, how's it gotten there. Um, but I think a lot of this trajectory of plastic, and you'll see in the exhibition, what's to be done with plastic is a big question, comes from its provenance. Where did it come from? How did it get there? What was it for? What was in its intent? Uh, so I thought, with that theme of provenance, it would be interesting to, to kick off their speakers and have them tell us a little bit about their provenance, how they have, uh, how their trajectory has gotten them to where they are, what they're doing, uh, and, and encountering plastic in their, in their daily lives. So, um, Malcolm, would you like to tell us a little bit about your own provenance? Sure. Uh, well, I started out in undergrad at the University of Minnesota, uh, interested in physics and, and science and engineering. Uh, ended up studying uh, archaeology and uh, still loved history. Um, and then it was in undergrad that I realized that um, there was this profession called conservation that sort of blends an appreciation for history, working with your hands, uh, the use of science to help preserve artifacts. And so that's what, that's what brought me into the profession. Uh, in grad school, I was encouraged to uh, subspecialize in historic technological artifacts. There's uh, a lot of art, uh, tr 
art conservators who trained as, uh, you know, for preserving art and ethnographic objects, very few uh, conservators that specialize in historic technology. So it's one of my personal interests, and uh, our director of the program encouraged me to focus on that, and it's what I've been doing ever since, and I just absolutely love it. So with technological collections, you know, especially things that represent the 20th century, it's hard to avoid uh, plastics. You know, it's really, it's an integral part of everything that we do nowadays, and you see it in all of our collections at the Science, at the Air and Space Museum. Great, okay. Um, Brenda. Well, I, I started off in Dublin, then I went to Cork, did organic chemistry, then I moved to London, and I did a PhD in material science and engineering, and that was basically dealing with plastic. So when that was over, I had to find a job. <laughs> so um, I'd always liked museums, but I never thought of actually working in one. And then this job came up in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and it was for a what was called a plastics conservator. So I basically had to dash off to the library and see what a plastics conservator did, but then I found that there was no such thing as a plastics <laughs> conservator. But I applied for the job anyhow, and I got it. And first of all, I was based in the ceramics department of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Be and the reasoning being that a lot of the plastics were containers and they were the same shape as ceramics. So I was in the ceramics department. And at that stage, people thought you could actually conserve plastics. But then we began to realize that maybe it would be better if I was moved to the conservation science because you can't actually conserve plastic in the same way as you can conserve more traditional materials because the treatments are a bit, can be a bit risky and they were unknown. Um, so basically I moved over to science and I started with a big survey of the collection, of all the collections, to see where plastics were in the collections and to see what state they were in. Of all the collections of in all the entire the collections. DNA? Well, I never did manage to get into them all and a lot of the time I was met with horror by the keepers in charge who were absolutely horrified at that I dare suggest that they had plastic in their collections. And we defined the term in that, the plastics denial syndrome. And basically, we came across quite a few plastics, but people didn't realize they were plastics because in, in collections like jewelry and metalwork, um, there was things like fake amber and fake tortoiseshell, and they were plastics. But it took a lot of convincing to tell people that they might have plastic in, collect in their collection and that it wasn't a big insult. And that has changed though. People are much more acceptable and know that there could be plastics and they're much more interested now to know what can be done, if anything, to preserve them. So that's how I ended up where I am. Okay. And Gavin, you. Okay. Yes, well, um, I'd just like to qualify your remark. I'm not an expert, <laughs> so I think I'm here as a kind of an artist everyman uh, on the panel <laughs> alongside these <laughs> definite experts. Um, but I, um, I mean, I studied fine art um, painting uh, initially in, uh, in Dunleary Art College, as it was then. Um, so I guess my first introduction to plastic as a material would have been acrylic paint, which of course is kind of a um, you know, acrylic uh, uh, polymer, I think, used as a, uh, a transmission uh, for, the, for the pigment. Um, and uh, I subsequently moved out of painting, um, did a, uh, actually a design degree, um, and uh, subsequently kind of came back into uh, uh, contemporary art, art making uh, and curation. So I have, um, I mean, I guess as an artist, I would have um, come across uh, plastic from uh, quite an early stage through, I was uh, mentioning earlier, um, light boxes uh, to view uh, color transparencies on, um, would have been made out of uh, acrylic plastic, uh, would have used um, a videotape, uh, 35 millimeter film, all of which is obviously obsolete now. Uh, my practice then subsequently, um, I became very much interested in the idea of, of obsolescence, of how technologies kind of uh, are, um, are kind of speeding up 
uh, at, uh, uh, at a rate unknown before, so that um, uh, what we once used um, you know, 10 years ago qu quickly becomes obsolete. Um, so kind of referencing that in my work, um, I, uh, I came across uh, um, the technique of laser cutting acrylic and I found this as a kind of a quite a sophisticated way to incorporate large bodies of kind of of text into my work. So I've uh, um, uh, incorporated that incorporated that into a sculptural installation. So that's kind of my a kind of a potted history of my journey through through plastic. Great. Okay. Well, I I have to say I warned the panelists that I would ask this just so we get the terms out of the way. Um, uh, so we know what we're dealing with and we don't have plastic denial syndrome. Who would like to define or give us a, a working definition of what plastic is or what we mean when we say plastic? Somebody volunteer or else I'll have to call on somebody like it's class. <laughs> the plastic's conservative. You take this one. Um, well, when we give it, when, if I'm giving a talk or a lecture on plastic, I always just say, well, plastic is basically the description of how a material behaves. It's not actually a material. So plastic is a material behavior. Mm -hmm. um, if we're being really specific, you have to call them polymers. But plastic and polymer have become more or less interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And to get the scientific bit over, it's basically very long chains of repeating units, um, small repeating units. And the number of units and the different methods of production will determine how those plastics behave. So. That's way better than I could have given. <laughs> so you, you win. Um, most plastics or many plastics that we use are made out of uh, essentially fossil fuels, though. Is that? But not not all of them. You can make plastics, what we call plastics, out of out of other things as well. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, again, when again when I'm giving a talk, I just well from a museum perspective and probably not from other technologies perspective, we have the, what we would call natural plastics. So. You know, they fit the they fit the definition. So amber and tortoiseshell, cellulose, things like that, mm -hmm. are plastic. Then big problematic plastics in museums are what we call semi-synthetic. So you have cellulose or rubber, and they're modified a bit. And then you have the completely synthetics, which I suppose is what people really call plastic. And originally they were made from the byproducts of coal. Now they're made from petroleum. Okay, and so. Obviously, there's a lot of things that can fit into that definition, a lot of ways we can get uh, materials that could be called plastic. Um, how important is it that we know what we're dealing with? Or do you ever encounter, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Malcolm, um, things that you've encountered. Uh, do you encounter things and you just don't know what this is and you have to discover and deal with it? Uh, I'd say initially, um, you know, we occasionally find things in storage where it's literally de degraded to just a powdered dust. <laughs> and then you do wonder which cellulosic uh, plastic it, it was. Um, but, but, you know, with years of experience, you do get a sort of sense of, of what you're looking at. Um, it always helps to, you know, when you really want to target, uh, you know, what is the best uh, storage environment for something uh, or what kind of preservation techniques we want to employ to try to make this material last a little bit longer. It is important to study what it is and do some analysis and figure out what you're dealing with. Um, most of the artifacts that I deal with are, you know, rarely just one plastic. Um, they're usually very complex composite materials. So that's, that's usually the biggest challenge for us is devising a preservation strategy that really, you know, looks, assesses all the different materials and all their different rates and modes of deterioration and sort of coming up with an ideal solution that really is the best thing for everything at once. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose, um, there are unique challenges with plastic and, and degradation and, and conservation. But Brenda, you touched on this, that you can't really, you said you can't really conserve plastics. And from what I've read, they degrade or they deteriorate in a different way than we're accustomed to with some materials. They can look fairly fine for a while and then kind of just poof. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think you don't really, you only really need to know the identification of the ones that degrade quite dramatically, I think. Um, it's nice to know the identification of everything, of course, but if you know what is about to degrade, what has the potential to degrade quite suddenly and quite dramatically, then you may be able to do, as Malcolm said, you may be able to slow it down or, you know, yeah, you can't reverse it. 
Um, but some of them do degrade quite dramatically, mm -hmm. and some artworks have degraded quite dramatically, and basically it was the degradation of a specific artwork, which is not a secret, but we don't say which one it was, because the, the um, trust don't really like uh, it publicised that much, but it was basically this degradation of a specific artwork, which of course was quite expensive, that triggered the conservation and the interest in plastic because up to that I think most people thought oh it's plastic we can get another one mm -hmm. so it it's it does provoke different reactions from from people um, and plastic has gone through many many kind of innovation many kind of life's lives because you know first of all it was the be all and end all it was fabulous it was the housewife's choice the going, it was the future then, it, well, no, first of all, actually, it was an imitator of natural materials. Then it was the future. Then it was really tacky. And now it's just causing problems for everybody. So, you know, it's not one or all of those things, I think. It's, mm. it's, it's unique. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you think about longevity and, and degradation, you know, when you're using plastics and polymers at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I mean, sometimes I kind of wake up in a cold sweat thinking about all the stuff I have on videotape <laughs> in the attic uh, that I had, me uh, had meant to, you know, that kind of student work and kind of early, early work that I had done. Um, that is, if it is on, it's on DV tape, it's on VHS tape, uh, or on color transparencies. Um, and, you know, the idea is that one day I will digitize that stuff, but I don't know what kind of condition it's going to be in. Uh, I moved. I did. I moved a, a few boxes there a couple of months ago, and I had a, like a, a printed artwork, even in a, in a plastic sleeve. And as I moved the plastic sleeve, the plastic sleeve went and <laughs> disintegrated. <laughs> and again, I, I, you know, I like many people, I'm under the you know assumption that you know a plastic sleeve is going to last indefinitely, but there are obviously huge kind of variances in the, um, the integrity of these, uh, these plastic objects. But when it comes to um, acrylic specifically that I use, um, I mean, it's something that I haven't really been able to get to the bottom of. Um, I mean, I'll just show you quickly uh, a, I mean, this is the, the kind of material that I use. So it's, it's, a, it's a PMMA. Uh, acrylic. Um, obviously, it's very useful for me um, because I can, unlike unlike glass, I can laser cut into it. It can be kind of laser etched into. Um, it's it's lightweight. It doesn't smash necessarily. Um, but the the question is, how long does it last? Mm. <laughs> and artworks are uh, historically supposed to last. You know, they enter into hopefully collections, museum collections, and a number of my works are in a uh, museum or the state collection. Um, and it's, uh, you know, what happens to it? <laughs> mm. uh, I, I mean, as far as I know, um, acrylic has been employed since maybe the, the 1930s by artists. I, I certainly know um, uh, Laszlo Mahalny Nagy um, used plexiglass in his, uh, some of his kind of um, kinetic uh, constructions. Um, uh, and, you know, so, and, and some other kinetic artists and then kind of going right through into, you know, people like Richard Hamilton, uh, kind of working with kind of lenticular uh, acrylic and you know painting and uh, onto on, onto acrylic, um, so uh, yeah. So this idea of of how how long it lasts mm. is um, uh, is uh, it's kind of scary. Like I mean, there's is, this is a bonkers paradox of yeah. of plastic. Like, does anybody know if in two hundred years all plastics just well, go, I <laughs> just melt away and turn to dust? Like, is, I, there, is there any chance it's going to happen, guys? <laughs> it depends on the plastic. I mean, yeah. conservatives rely on plastics for most of our treatments. You know, the, the synthetic resin adhesives that we use, um, B72, for example. I mean, the, I think the rule of thumb is that it's anticipated to last about 200 years before it starts to discolor or, uh, it, you know, changes its properties and becomes less reversible. Um, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the fundamental principle for what we do in, in conservation is utilizing very stable, you know, specifically engineered plastics 
um, that are not going to change their properties over time. So, like I said, it depends on the plastic. There's some things, like, like your, your piece of acrylic there. I wonder if, if the, the laser cutting, it may look fine now, but maybe in 20, 30 years, you may start to get stress cracking coming yes. out from those yeah. edges. Yeah, I, th I, I, did, I did kind of read up on that and that uh, cutting into it and then solvents as well, right. um, obviously are the, the things that uh, create those stress fractures. But I mean, I look at in our building, for example, um, our studios building, uh, some of the, the window panes, it's an old school, and some of the window panes that I assume were knocked out by, by uh, footballs or something, like in the playground, <laughs> uh, were replaced with Perspex. And they are, I don't know how long they've been in place, but they are, you know, they're baggy, they're cloudy, yeah. they're showing real sound, signs of stress. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, um, uh, according to Perspex, um, ten, they're guaranteed for 10 years. And I did actually email them to ask them actually how long <laughs> they considered they would last in indoor and outdoor conditions, but they, uh, they haven't got back as of yet. <laughs> that, uh, that raises a point uh, about like, what's the enemy of plastic? Is it, you know, is, is it the normal kind of uh, environmental conditions that, that curators have to, uh, to worry about? Or, I mean, I assume you don't have to worry about mites and pests coming in eating plastic, which is a big problem for some conservators, but not for, nothing's gonna eat your plastic, uh, your plastic objects. But what, what is the enemy of uh, plastics in, in collections? Um, UV light. And, and again, it depends on which plastic. Um, but basically, UV light is the enemy of everything in a museum um, because UV light has enough energy to break the bonds of plastic. So that's why in a museum you would always exclude it. So you have coatings on the windows. Um, also, temperature and humidity. And, you know, some plastics are a lot more stable than others. Um, but basically, they eventually most will revert to their starting material or will be attacked by oxygen. The big problem with plastics is that when they were made, I think everybody knows the thing about built-in obsolescence. So, um, if especially in a design collection, a uh, manufacturer will make something and put in enough stabilizers for it to last, I don't know, 20 years. And the problem in a museum is that you take something that has a life of maybe 20 years and you try and ex extend that life. So the antioxidants, the light stabilizers, the heat stabilizers, all those things which would be sacrificed, they're all, they all eventually become used up and then the environment will start attacking the plastic itself. Mm. So we're usually just the harbingers of doom, basically <laughs> telling people. Mm. Um, but you are fighting against uh, what is going to happen. There's a mortality to, there is, to yeah. plastics that other yeah. objects don't have. And you just have to come to terms with that to yeah, a certain extent. Yeah, I think so. C can you tell us a little bit about the, the I was reading about uh, your work on the, on the Neil Armstrong spacesuit and how, you know, your approach to, to that aspect of it, of, of like, uh, I think it was the neoprene that there's just right. only so much you can do. Right. And, and that's, I mean, the Apollo spacesuits are, are primarily plastics, you know, these very complex composite multi-layered uh, assemblies with aluminum hardware. Um, but the most critical element is, the, uh, is, that, is that gas chamber, basically the, you know, the pressure portion, and that's where they used uh, a combination of uh, neoprene and latex. And originally the, the spacesuits only had a, basically a working life of about six, uh, six months. So they had to go on their mission and utilize the suit within, a, within their six month uh, time window because they just couldn't rely on, on how well that, uh, uh, that rubber layer is gonna survive. So here we are, you know, decades later, you know, at the time, the, the scientists, the engineers, that's what they're focused on. This thing has to perform to the utmost. It has to last through the mission. After that, who cares? It's gonna go to the museum and you know, they weren't even thinking about going to a museum at it either. Um, <clears throat> so, so by the time the, you know, the museum you know, acquired the suit several years afterwards, um, and then within, I'd say, 10, 20 years, you know, we could start to see that uh, there were issues going on. The rubber bladder was getting uh, very stiff. Uh, it was starting to break up and crack. Uh, there's a rubber seal that follows up along the zipper so the astronaut can get in and actually still form this, uh, this hermetic seal. Uh, that material today is, is, I mean, if you flex it now, it just, it just literally shatters. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. I mean, these are, these are iconic objects. You know, these, you know, the Neil Armstrong spacesuit was involved in 
one of mankind's greatest technological achievements. And uh, so putting it on display was a big challenge because people want to see this stuff. You know, you can't just lock it up and, and keep it in storage forever. Uh, we have a whole vault that has over 300 spacesuits in it as it is. Low temperature, uh, low humidity, zero light. Everything is on a sort of a cadaver board. It is like walking into a morgue. It's kind of a creep, creepy experience seeing all these spacesuits uh, stacked up on these shelves. Um, but people want to see these objects. I mean, this is why museums have them. So. Uh, our challenge was to, was to sort of replicate that ideal storage environment and be able to put Neil Armstrong on display. And so we designed a, uh, a display case that does provide the low temperature environment. It has air filtration because um, I, I call it the spacesuit funk. So all the spacesuits have this aroma, which is, uh, I don't know if it's leftovers from the, from the astronauts, but it's, it's, it's basically the breakdown of those polymeric materials that make up the suit. And uh, it's, it's a key indicator that those materials are breaking down. So, Would you just love it if plastic did not break down at all and just like we're, <laughs> you know, what, what everybody else is hoping for, that <laughs> plastics could biodegrade and they could be, you know, processed through the atmosphere. Do you just wish that plastics would like stick around forever and be perfect? No. <laughs> <laughs> because the vast majority of the plastics uh, in, in the consumer world are used for one-off disposable things like water bottles, you know. And you know, I think that's the biggest global challenge right now is what do we do with all this plastic? Um, things like Neil Armstrong's spacesuit, yes. Things like yeah. adhesives used to repair our historical cultural heritage, yes. I want it to last 200 years. But it's all the other stuff that uh, I think we need to come up with a different answer. So how do you feel about like, the push towards things like bioplastics and you know, biodegradable plastic bags and things that are perhaps not uh, you know, traditional plastics but are a different kind of uh, biodegradable Polymer, right? Is, is it a pol let's, let's just call them biodegradable plastic bags, things like that. How do you feel about uh, put, parking the environmental benefits of that? How do you feel about that as a future for material culture if it's, if it's meant to be biodegrading, to be even more temporary? Like, does that pose, are you just going to give up and say, forget this, like, move me back to ceramics? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you just have to realize that they are going to degrade. I mean, lots of things are going to degrade, but if you decide, when curators tr are going to accession something, they often say to me, have you any idea how long it'll last? And that's a big step forward that they say that now. Mm -hmm. And you just give them your best estimate, and then they make up their mind whether they're going to acquire it or not, because if you just decide, there's various arguments, isn't it? There's public money you're spending. Are you spending public money on something that's only going to last 50 years? Or if that's an argument, then you're going to ignore a whole swathe of design, maybe, and a whole swathe of artworks. So you don't just ignore an artwork because it might degrade. But I think you have to make a reasoned judgment on what you're going to, in what time and money you're going to invest in trying to preserve it. Um, biodegradable plastics are just the next stage. I mean, I hate to say it, but we've had terrible problems with artists <laughs> using, using non-biodegradable plastics because a lot of them, they just mix something up until they get uh, something that they like. Yeah, but but probably, <laughs> probably totally ignoring the manufacturer's instructions. So we have had things, and I have come across things, that really looked lovely from the artist's point of view, but within you know a few years, um, they just started falling apart. And it's quite interesting that now artists are actually asking what the longevity of some materials are. And I think basically it's to do with economics, because people now know. I mean, there was a big project, but AXA Art Insurance sponsored a project trying to find out how long plastics would last because obviously they were being hit by claims um, and they were trying to make it a bit like I suppose actuaries who are you know ins insuring people they wanted a formula to insure art mm. and unfortunately they never got really enough answers but people are aware now that plastics don't last forever so mm. it's it's a fact um, we, we were talking about the, the piece out there of the tiles that have combined sand and plastics and you know I think that d design or artwork if, you, if, if that's the right term you know addresses this issue of, of uh, reuse recycling biodegradability and kind of the piece is as much about the process and its its life and um, as what it actually has created these beautiful tiles um, I've encountered you know artists 
utilizing plastic in this kind of meta way to to talk about its materiality and its um, role in our environment or um, um, I mean I think artists are certainly referencing manufacturing and kind of mechanical reproduction uh, kind of throughout the 20th century and you can obviously going to see that within like kind of artists and designers come together in, in the Bauhaus and um, uh, kind of formulating kind of new ways of working and um, kind of you know um, conceptual art then kind of allowed artists to uh, not worry so much about the kind of the aura of the original art object um, uh, so I mean I think artists are kind of moving away from, uh, many artists move away from objects entirely. Um, or, you know, the idea that, um, uh, you know, an artwork is just kind of the singular piece um, that can't be uh, remade. I mean, for example, uh, I mean, if you work with, with plexiglass, um, uh, I guess a, an interesting question for an artist, and it's kind of something that I've uh, thought about, is once that plastic starts to degrade, um, do you make a decision that that wobbly, cloudy, <laughs> you know, saggy artwork, that is the artwork? Or, you know, you can make equally make the decision that actually the idea was the artwork, so I can actually just say, okay, let's, it's time to replace, mm. replace these panels. And I think you're kind of gonna, you can, I can see that happening uh, uh, a lot more in the future. You know, that maybe uh, um, something is written into the, uh, <laughs> into the artwork and its care in the future, that it can be, it has a certain point where it can be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, as far as artists using uh, kind of single use degradable works, I mean, that definitely is something that you see. And you see artists making, um, you know, complex or quite kind of simple light works using plastic bags and I have no idea what their what their plan for uh, for the future is um, and I guess buyer, buyer beware mm. <laughs> that's an interesting the idea of replacing you know replacing renewing the the artwork and not being so caught up in the original materiality you know of it, it from a conservation point of view do you ever take that approach of you know with Moving, moving uh, artworks or, or pieces of design, you know, you might have to replace a, a motor to, to keep it going. Um, would you replace plastics in that way, or would you replace something that is central or visible to a, to a piece? Well, I think artworks and, and design objects are quite different. Mm. So with artworks, thankfully, the V&A doesn't collect modern sculpture. <laughs> uh, but I do know that like Tate, for instance, if the artist is living, they all before they acquire something, they try to do an interview to see what the artist's um, intent is, because it has been known where people have tried to say, to save, especially things like foams degrading, and the artist said, no, 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 I want it to be like that. Um, mm. That's part of the work. So as I say, artworks are different, but for a design object, if it was interfering with the kind of visitor's experience of it, I think we would replace a small part, but also we would let the visitor know that it wasn't all original. Um, <coughs> I think it's when you have something that looks pristine and 90% of it mightn't be original, then mm. that would never occur in a museum. Uh, with plastics, because they can cause problems for if something begins to degrade, it can continue to degrade. So that's when you might make a decision. But otherwise, you probably just let an object, um, you know, you don't, it, it doesn't have to look perfect. But unfortunately, plastics can cause more problems <coughs> the more they degrade. So you would have to take a decision on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, Aging gracefully, and that's really, you know, a, a lot of that is, you know, aesthetics. I mean, at the Air and Space Museum, I mean, there's, I guess with all technological collections, there's this long history of sort of celebrating the craft of the restoration, and you're absolutely replicating the original techniques that went into making whatever that object was. 
Um, but today, you know, we're much more preservation focused. So um, that's one of my challenges at the Air and Space Museum is, you know, taking things like doped fabric. You know, you've got this cellulosic based uh, uh, dope applied to cotton or linen fabric from, you know, World War I, World War II aircraft. Um, and I'm, <coughs> I'm very stubborn. So, uh, so that's, what, that's one of my main things is trying to make sure that, you know, we, we do come up with clever preservation techniques. So um, right now we're working on a World War II bomber that, you know, very historically important, survived 200 missions over Europe, never lost a single crew member. And uh, it was assumed that all the control surfaces, which are doped fabric, and were just shredded, they were just full of tears, they were, had shrunk, um, that all of that would have to be taken off and replaced with new material. Um, but yet all the original paint on the aircraft is entirely original. So it has all the patches and all the, all the bombing missions, all the sort of glorious patina um, is still present. It looks just like the, the color photograph we have of it in southern Germany in 1946. It's, it's remarkable. So our challenge was let's, let's look at this differently and let's apply paintings conservation techniques and, and try to save those original consoles, control surfaces. And so we did a lining technique. We, we adhered the original uh, doped fabric back on there. Uh, we filled in all the all the shrinkage gaps and mended all the tears. We left all the combat damages because that's part of its sort of overall. You mentioned aura, you know that aura of authenticity. We want people to look at something that's that historically important and know that everything they're looking at is exactly as it was in that picture from 1946. Um, so that's it, that's one of my main challenges. You know how do we do that? Because there, there's some plastics like the you know we have Charles Lindbergh's. Um, uh, uh, his, his plotting uh, board for, for navigation, complete dust. I mean, it's just yeah. turned completely into just powdered uh, polycellulose acetate or nitrate. Things like that are just completely gone. And, that, and, that, and that's where digitizing, you mentioned the, the audio tapes. I mean, that's the biggest challenge with all the archives across the world is making sure that you at least document what you have before it is gone. So I want to go to some questions, but thinking about the, the future, um, is this a, like you said, Brenda, just a race against time? We just have to come to terms with all these artworks and uh, design pieces, you know, uh, fading or melting or turning into powder? Or is there, uh, do you anticipate uh, new technologies, new approaches that could, if not halt, this degradation of, of uh, material culture and, and artworks, slow it? Or is it, uh, are, we are where we are and it's going to go only one way? Oh gosh, give me the good news, <laughs> it's the good news. <laughs> well, I, th I think when you work in a museum, you have to be extremely pragmatic because maybe there will be, maybe there, w maybe there will be ways of slowing or stopping. I mean, already there are some ways of slowing oxidation using, using um, technology developed in the food industry, but unfortunately, it about doubles the amount of storage space required for the object. And as anyone who works in a museum knows that storage space is at a premium. So there might be something happening, but whether it will actually be able to be implemented, who knows? There's always another, there's always other kind of contingencies. Mm. And if you had one object that you're trying to preserve, you would hope that there would be something that could happen. But when you have an entire large collection, as Malcolm knows, it's, I mean, you can recommend your storage, can perfect storage conditions, but can you actually achieve them is another thing. Mm. What about proactively working with artists for, for new commissions, for example? Is there anything you would say to, we had an artist here who was working with Perspex, for example, um, that you would say uh, to ensure that their work, you know, um, is easier to conserve, lasts longer for posterity? Well, we used to work with, we used to have courses in the Royal College of Art and we were actively, actively discouraged from saying things like that because we were told then, oh no, you'll, you'll stifle the creativity of the artist. <laughs> but I think the artists, when they discover that maybe public collections won't buy their works, then I think maybe they might become a bit more pragmatic. But it's not really, it's, it's not really up to conservators to tell yeah. artists what materials to use, I think. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, um, I think uh, there might be some mics going around if anybody has uh, a question or something they'd like to add to the, the discussion. Yeah, one up here and one there as well. 
Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, okay, hi. I don't know if this, oh yeah, it's working. Um, I was just wondering, um, uh, Brenda, you mentioned that uh, when, manuf when they're manufacturing, they put in some chemicals like anti-weather or anti-environment. Is it possible for um, to put that on after we're manufacturing as well to help preserve it? It's like get rid of humidity and whatnot? Unfortunately not, no. I mean, maybe that is something that, well, you have a solid object, so you can't get it into it. And in conservation, you try not to change the uh, appearance of the object. So we're quite reluctant to use coatings and things like that. But apparently there are some developments in <coughs> the use of nanotechnology, which again is quite far away from I know it's quite far away from use in the music in the VNA anyway, but you can't actually reintroduce at the moment. You can't reintroduce additives. I think uh, there's a question down here. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you, with with all the different plastics, is there some that are completely? crumbly and some that hold their strength a bit for longer, have you found? Well, the, the earlier plastics, for example, the, the cellulosic plastics are, are the biggest challenge. Um, so cellulose acetate, cellulose nitrate, those things uh, do not last very long at all. Um, but things like acrylic, I mean, the, the rule of thumb is that, uh, you know, acrylic is actually generally considered to be relatively stable. Um, almost all the synthetic resins that uh, conservators use, you know, those are basically plastics. We, we dissolve them into with different organic solvents so that we can either apply them as a coating or apply them as, as an adhesive to repair something. Uh, and like I said, those like things like B72 is, is sort of predicted to last about 200 years, um, which is far more than any other sort of, you know, commercially available consumer type products, plastics. While we wait for somebody to get less bashful and ask a question, I want to ask you about that. Do you um, do you find that with the knowledge of the, you know, the the kind of impermanence of plastics that it's changing your pr your practice or how how you do conservation or looking for alternatives that are, are longer lasting or is this the best kind of you said B seventy B seventy two B seventy two yeah B seventy two sounds yeah. like a great product. It's it's the go to adhesive for uh, for for many conservators. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's your favorite plastic then? <laughs> well, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite versatile. Um, but, you know, conservatives have a whole range. I mean, there, there are dozens and dozens of different synthetic resins that we use, you know, depending on exactly what the treatment is and what the object is that you're, you're trying to conserve. So um, you really do have to be sort of briefed in the whole range of things and different things have different pliability, different elast you know, uh, uh, you know, flexibility over time, uh, how they're applied, what kind of organic solvents uh, that they dissolve in. So, um, you know, the, one of the rule of thumbs is that you want to make sure that when you, when you repair something that you can completely undo it in the future without causing damage to the original object. And so knowing what organic solvents, uh, the material is, is going to be soluble in the future is a way to, to make sure that you don't cause harm in the future mm -hmm. to those objects. Before, um, before we, were, we were chatting before the event uh, about um, when polymers are used for replicas, and we were talking about the case of the um, the rhino horn over at the National Museum of Ireland, and how that's a, uh, a kind of a, a unique use case for this um, this material, and how it has kind of a wonderful application in that regard. So that was a that was a fascinating uh, kind of unusual or surprising use of it. Are there any other totally surprising or favorite kind of examples of of plastics that you've encountered, or that you think? Um, people would be surprised about her, uh, if not a favorite plastic, a, a surprising plastic. Mm. Putting you on the spot then. <laughs> to I think the most <coughs> kind of related to that is what I said about the <coughs> plastics denial syndrome. I think basically what's happened over the past 20 years or 25 years is that people have become more educated and realized that they're are plastics in their collections. Um, as I said, we have come across a lot of cases of fake amber, fake tortoiseshell, um, fake ivory. Um, so I think people are always surprised that in fact this is not the real thing. And they only 
usually realizes when it begins to degrade and cause problems. Um, so it's not a favorite, but I think it's probably the most surprising thing for people and for myself as well, because I didn't realize it, are the very early semi-synthetics, which, as Malcolm says, are really unstable. And they turn up in a lot of very strange places, like in, in fashion, in sculpture, in furniture, in textile as buttons or a thing. I mean, everywhere they turn up. Um, and I think you, you need to know, you need to know the chronology of uh, of the dating of when plastics were introduced and then if somebody brings you something or say, oh, I have something, you think, oh, well, it could be. And then you're thinking along a certain mm -hmm. line. But it's not actually a favorite, but I think it's, it's probably most unusual. People don't realize that mm -hmm. they are so old. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the slides that you actually have? Uh, no, uh, my slides, I think, are a, <coughs> a bit... Um, a bit newer. This one is basically what we do now is we're teaching people to try and identify plastics or to identify the the five that cause problems and we're teaching them. We do have um, we do have an analysis but most people don't have analytical techniques so basically we're trying to teach people to identify them by smelling them, by touching them, by things like that and this is an example of one of the um, courses we gave. And the next are just some quite tragic cases. Unfortunately, they mainly come from the Museum of Childhood at Bethnal Green. And a lot of these um, were obviously well-loved uh, toys that were donated. And this is a 1950s rubber, um, Bendy Bunny, and he had a, his whole little wardrobe with him. Somebody had knitted cardigans and things like that. We find that a lot in toys. Um, uh, this is a... Oops not working. This is another one, but the, I think the best one is the scary doll. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that is, that is actually a very common polymer, that's PVC. And you know you have PVC shower curtains and PVC windows and PVC whatever, but PVC is uh, very much used in um, cheap toys or not so cheap toys and things. And I think this one is really scary. You can see the effect of UV light and things on that. Wow. I have to ask about the first slide, though. What are the five, they sound like, you know, five scary bandits of plastic world. What are the five that, that you tell people to watch out for? Well, there's the cellulosics, as, my, as Malcolm said. There's cellulose nitrate, cellulose acetate. We include rubber in it, um, PVC, as you saw there, and polyurethane. Those ones all degrade. Um, quite quickly. Okay. And if you can identify them, then at least you can keep an eye on them. <sighs> okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I was going to comment. Uh, <laughs> I noticed this when, when I checked into my hotel when I arrived here. Um, the, the headboard of, of the board, uh, of, the, of the bed, looked like it was upholstered in leather. And, and I, I think that's one of the most remarkable things is that um, you know, you're really seeing the advances in technology where Polymer scientists can make purely synthetic, <coughs> synthetic feeling, the, the appearance. I mean, you dig your fingernails into it, and I can't tell if that's real leather <laughs> or if it's polyurethane <laughs> or, or, or vinyl. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and on the other hand, you've got a lot of leathers, mostly um, you know, upholstery leather, shoe leather, things like that. Uh, garment leather is, um, is, may actually be leather, but they'll put a protective vinyl coating on top of it to make it resistant to staining and to uh, make sure it's better protected. So the, the, the sort of plastics are, are, are turning more like leather, this natural material. It's like one of my favorite mater materials in the world. It's you know, leather is this incredible thing, but yet leather is now being ma manufactured so it looks more like plastic and behaves like plastic, and plastic is being, you know, coming in to replicate uh, uh, leather. It's, it's kind of a bizarre world we're living in now. <laughs> wow. um, I think we have one, one more question or time for uh, just one or two. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Yeah, I missed the, the first part of your presentation, but I don't know if you're aware of this. It's not necessarily art, but um, guitar companies in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, especially Gretsch and Gibson, in the United States, they would make uh, the pick guards and the plastic bindings out of the cellulose nitrate. And a lot of times, uh, some of these guitars are worth a lot of money. But uh, if they're stored in cases over years, they do this thing called outgassing, where the, uh, the material deteriorates and it ruins all the plating and stuff on the metal parts 
I just wonder, and then people, do, if we worked on how to restore these with, and, you know, using epoxy resins and things, try to save them. I just wonder if you're aware of that, or if you've ever encountered any of that yourself. If you know about the musical instrument uh, restoration, if you've ever seen any of those examples, that's all. Ever encountered anything like that? I, I don't know of any techniques to preserve it, especially once you see the visual signs. Um, yeah, it's, that's something with plastics is that um, they may look fine for you know decades, and it, it all depends on what they were exposed to before they come into a museum collection. Um, and then suddenly, once that sort of induction phase of, of, of chemical breakdown starts, there's really there's no stopping it. But um, dealing with off-gassing, you know, th that's where identifying the types of plastics you have in your collection is really important, so that you're not storing inappropriate materials with other materials. Uh, with spacesuits in particular, I mentioned that, that spacesuit funk. Uh, one of the main aspects of our display case is to make sure that it has activated uh, ventilation. So the, the mannequin that he's standing on is actually providing fresh filtered air from the inside and pushing that out. So we're actually expelling those corrosive vapors out of the inside of the, uh, of the spacesuit. Um, but yeah, storing a, anything with any sort of cellulosic plastics like you see on a lot of these early uh, uh, musical instruments, it's important that those, those, that off-gassing is allowed to, to leave the, the object. Otherwise, it will just catalyze the, the, the rate of degradation. I think time for our last question, yeah. Hi. Um, so I was wondering if you find in the museums that you're working in, um, as you sort of come to terms with the fact that you can't necessarily halt the degradation of some plastics, are more resources being given to, as you mentioned, like dis digitization or photographic documentation of objects to try and preserve the information that they have, at least, if you can't preserve the object itself? Or is there simply not time where there's too much of it? I don't know. Good question. It, it's, a huge, it's a huge challenge. I, mean, I think I mean, all museums across the, across the globe are grappling with the fact that you know, the, the process of digital, like photographic collections, I mean, we were, we were looking at, we restored the, the Starship Enterprise model a few years ago. We we're looking at these old photographs from the 1960s. And, you know, the colors have changed and we're trying to decipher, you know, what was the original color. You've, tried to, you've got to sort of, sort of step back in time and have an understanding of how that photograph and the colors within it have modified over time. Um, that's why it's so important that all this stuff gets digitized right now. Thankfully, we, you know, there, there are companies that actually do that. Our, our archives, we brought in an, an, an external company uh, to, to go through. A, just, it was just a portion of our archival collection. There's still just tons of other material that has not yet been digitized. But um, that has to happen before these things are gone for good. Kevin, you have to go up and get those tapes. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, one summer I'm just going to take three months off. And <laughs> um, well, I think we, we have to leave it there. We've hit. Uh, oh, I think we're going to go for one more question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, thank you. One more question. I really just wanted to ask you about polyester. Um, how does that rate in the Bandits League? Um, polyester is pretty stable. Are you talking about solid polyester, not no, polyester? No, film, like polyester film. Oh, yeah, polyester film is okay. I mean, you recommend that you you, re you replace all your images and put them onto polyester film because it is much more stable than acetate or nitrate. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, you got your question <laughs> just in time. Um, so, uh, listen, thank you guys very much for, for coming, but also uh, let's give a warm round of applause for our wonderful panel. Thank you guys, and uh, thanks for coming. If you have a question for an individual uh, on the panel, uh, feel free to come down, but uh, thanks again. <laughs>